Welcome back, everyone. This is part eight in our series on supervised sentiment analysis, the final screencast in the series. We're going to be talking about recurrent neural network or RNN classifiers. I suppose this is officially our first step into the world of deep learning for sentiment analysis. This slide gives an overview of the model, and then let's work through it in some detail. So we've got a single example with three tokens, the rock rules. These models are prepared for variable length sequences, but this example has to have, happens to have length three. And the first step to get this model started is a familiar one. We're going to look up each one of those tokens in what is presumably a fixed embedding space here. So for each token, we'll get a vector representation. The next step is that we have some learned parameters, a weight matrix WXH. And the subscript indicates that we're going from the inputs X into the hidden layer H. So that's a first transformation. And that weight matrix is used at each one of these time steps. Um, there is a second learn weight matrix, which I've called WHH to indicate that we are now traveling through the hidden layer. Uh, and so we start at some initial state H0, which could be an all zero or a randomly initialized vector or a vector coming from some other component in the model. Uh, and that representation is combined with the representation that we derive going vertically up from the embedding, usually in some additive fashion to create this hidden state here, H1. And those parameters WHH are used again at each one of these time steps so that we have two learned weight matrices as part of the core structure of this model. The one that takes us from embeddings into the hidden layer and the one that travels us across the hidden layer. And again, those are typically combined in some additive fashion to create these internal hidden representations. Now we can do anything we want with those internal hidden representations. When we use RNNs as classifiers, we do what is arguably the simplest thing which is take the final representation and use that as the input to a standard softmax classifier. So from the point of view of H3 going to Y here, we just have a learn weight matrix for the classifier, maybe also a bias term. But from this point here, this is really just a classifier of the sort we've been studying up until this point in the unit. Of course, we could elaborate this model in all sorts of ways. It could run bi-directionally. We could make more full use of the different hidden representations here, but in the simplest mode, our RNN classifiers will just derive hidden representations at each time step and use the final one as the input to a classifier. A couple of things I would say about this. First, if you would like a further layer of detail on how these models are structured and optimized, I would encourage you to look at this pure NumPy reference implementation of an RNN classifier that is included in our course code distribution. I think that's a great way to get a, get a feel for the recursive process of you know, computing through full sequences and then having the error signals back propagate through to update the weight matrix. But for now, I think just understanding the, the core structure of this model is sufficient. I just wanna remind you from the previous screencast that we're very close to the idea of distributed representations of features that I introduced before. Recall that for this mode, what we do is look up each token in an embedding space, just as we do for the RNN. But instead of learning some complicated combination function with a bunch of learned parameters, we simply combine them via sum or average. And that's the basis, that's the input to the classifier here. The RNN can be considered an elaboration of that because instead of assuming that these vectors here will be combined in some simple way like sum or mean, we now have really vast capacity to learn a much more complicated way of combining them that is optimal with respect to the classifier that we're trying to fit. Um, but fundamentally, these are very similar ideas. And if it happened that sum or mean as in this picture was exactly the right function to learn for your data, then the RNN would certainly have the capacity to do that. Uh, we just tend to favor the RNN because it can learn, of course, a much wider range of complicated custom functions that are particular to the problem that you've posed. Now, so far we've been operating in the mode which I've called standard RNN data set preparation. Let's linger over that in a little bit of detail. Suppose that we have two examples containing the tokens ABA and BC. Those are our two raw inputs. The first step in the standard mode is to look up each one of those in some, in, in some list of indices. And then those indices are keyed into an embedding space and those finally give us the vector representations of each example. So that really and truly the input to the RNN is a list of vectors. It's just that we have typically obtained those vectors by looking them up in a fixed embedding space. And so for example, since A occurs twice in this first example, it is literally repeated as the first and third vectors here. 
Now, I think you can see latent in this picture the possibility that we might drop the embedding space and instead just directly input lists of vectors. And that is one way that we will explore later on in the quarter of using contextual models like BERT. We would simply look up entire token streams and get back lists of vectors and use those as fixed inputs to a model like an RNN. And that's a first step toward fine tuning models like BERT on problems like the ones we've posed in this unit. So have that idea in mind as we talk next about fine tuning strategies. Now, another practical note, what I've shown you so far is what you'd call a simple vanilla RNN. Uh, LSTMs, long short-term memory networks, uh, are much more powerful models and we'll kind of default to them when we do experiments. The fundamental issue is that plain RNNs tend to perform poorly with very long sequences. You get that error signal from the classifier there at the final token, and now information has to flow all the way back to, down through the network. It could be a very long sequence, and the result is that the information coming from that error signal is often lost or distorted. Now, LSTM cells are a prominent response to this problem. They introduce mechanisms that control the flow of information and help you avoid the problems of optimization that arise for regular RNNs. Now, I'm not gonna take the time here to review this mechanism in detail. I would instead recommend these two excellent blog posts. They have great diagrams and really detailed discussions. They're, they can do a much better job than I can of really conveying the intuitions visually and also with math. And I think you could pick one or both and really pretty quickly gain a deep understanding of precisely how LSTM cells are functioning. And the final thing here is just a code snippet to show you how easy it is to use our course code repository to fit models like this. In the context of sentiment analysis, you can again make use of this SST library. And what I've done here is a kind of complicated version showing you a bunch of different features. So uh, in cell two, you can see that I'm gonna have a pointer to glove and I'm gonna create a glove lookup uh, using the 50 dimensional vectors just to keep things simple. The feature function for this model is not one that returns count dictionaries. It's important for the structure of the model we're going to use that you input raw sequences of tokens. So all we're doing here is downcasing the sequence and then splitting on white space. Of course, you could do something more sophisticated. Uh, the idea, though, is that you want to align with the glove vocabulary. Our model wrapper is doing a few things. It's creating a vocabulary and loading in an embedding using this glove space. That'll be the initial embedding for our model. Uh, and if you leave this step out, you'll have a randomly initialized embedding space, which uh, might be fine as well, but presumably Glove will give us a step up. And then we set up the torch RNN classifier. And what I've done here is expose a lot of the different keyword arguments, not all of them. There are lots of knobs that you can fiddle with as is typical for deep learning models. Uh, maybe the one I would call out is that we are using that fixed embedding that we got from Glove. And I have set early stopping equals true, which might help you efficiently optimize these models. Otherwise, you'll have to figure out how many iterations you actually want it to run for, and you might run it for much too long or much less time than is needed to get an optimal model. The early stopping options, and there are a few other parameters involved in that, might help you optimize these models efficiently and effectively. In the end, though, having set up all that stuff, you call fit as usual and return the train model. And in that context, you can simply use SST experiment with these previous components to conduct experiments with RNNs just as you did for simpler linear models as in previous screencasts. The one change, which will be, will be familiar from the previous screencast, is that you need to set vectorize equals false. And that is important because, again, we're going to let the model process these examples. We don't want to pipe everything through some kind of dict vectorizer. That's strictly for hand-built feature functions and sparse linear models. Here in the land of deep learning, vectorize equals false and we'll use the components of the model to represent each example as I discussed before.